This bridge is the only link between Perry Island and the rest of Ontario, and it's falling apart. The upper portion turned 110 years old in 2022, but the supports underneath could date back as far as the 1890s. The people of Wasoxing First Nation on Perry Island are fed up. They depend on this bridge, but it breaks down all the time. And despite more than 30 years of reports saying that this bridge needs to be replaced, this community is still waiting. Welcome to the Wasoxing Swing Bridge. This is the second part of my story on the swing bridges of Georgian Bay. If you haven't seen the first part yet about Little Current, please watch that one now. I'll link it in the description. Perry Island is close to the town of Perry Sound on Georgian Bay. This is Wasoxing First Nation, an Anishinaabe community that was formerly called Perry Island First Nation. By the mid-1800s, colonizers had already heavily impacted the indigenous peoples of this area. They had pushed many to become farmers, converted them to Christianity, and at the same time had been driving them farther from their traditional lifestyles. Settlers kept coming to the area and taking more of the land. Ultimately, the government would push Anishinaabek in the area onto a reserve. It would be called Perry Island First Nation, taking its name from the large island that would become its home. The land here wasn't particularly good for growing things, but the community managed to get about half of its food needs from farming. For other supplies, they would turn to the stores in Perry Sound, but again, this was a push toward the colonial system as the only way to survive. There is a long history of what settlers have done to indigenous peoples in this country that I can't get into in this video. There are a lot of books and films about this if you want to look into it on your own. If you're looking for this area specifically, I recommend some works by Franz Mishquad Konica, who was from Wisoxing. The key point here is, by the 1890s, settler forces had already disrupted the lives of Anishinaabek several times. Then came the railway. John Rudolphus Booth was a capitalist in Ottawa. He wanted to build a railway line from the Great Lakes to Montreal, and it was supposed to be the most direct way to get grain across the country. Booth took over a failing operation called the Perry Sound Colonization Railway, of course it was called that, and he promised to follow the original plans of having the line end at Perry Sound. However, that didn't happen. My English name is John Rice, but my Ojibwe name is Zagoske, which means a sun ray. I'm Bear Clan, and I'm from here, Wasoxing First Nation. J.R. Booth, a lumber baron, who had lots of influence in Ottawa. Basically, he tried to get the town of Perry Sound to be his port for shipping lumber out. But uh, he didn't quite get along with the mayor. So J.R. Booth went to here on the, on the island here, Perry Island. He went to the other end and found uh, a harbor there that nowadays is known as Depot Harbor. Depot Harbor had deep waters, so it wasn't hard to turn this into a major shipping port. The full story of this settler town within a First Nation is long and complicated, but it's an absolutely fascinating and heartbreaking tale. I hope that in a future video, I can work with knowledge keepers here in Wisoxing to talk about what this town has meant and continues to mean for the community. Booth had made up his mind. He would abandon his plans for a port in Perry Sound and instead make his railway cut across the First Nation. So basically, he was about to upset both the people of Perry Sound and Perry Island First Nation all at once. But how would Booth get permission to build his railway across Perry Island? Well, he sort of didn't. Politicians had changed the Indian Act in 1887. They made it so that anyone wanting to build a railway could go to a First Nation and just take their land, all because building railways was in the, quote, public interest, unquote. In February of 1895, Booth sent surveyors to Perry Island. They entered the First Nation's territory without permission and began to plan a route. As you might imagine, the people of Perry Island were angry. Chief and council made it their official position that no railway would ever come to Perry Island. That September, Booth's Railway reached Rose Point on the mainland. And despite the community's wishes, Perry Island would be next. Booth wrote to Indian Affairs. He formally requested more than 300 acres on Perry Island to build his railway. Indian Affairs sent representatives to Perry Island First Nation to negotiate, but because of that expropriation law, there's no way those talks could have been in good faith. Indian Affairs gave two options. The first was the hard way. 
Perry Island could sign a contract and give away the land at a cost of $9 per acre. Now that happened to be slightly above the going price for land at that time. The other option was the harder way. The government could simply take the land. On October 9th, 1895, the Perry Island First Nation government signed the contract. By 1896, the swing bridge was complete, and in January of 1897, the first train rolled across. By 1912, the upper portion of the bridge needed replacement. They installed this structure, which is still in use 110 years later. Around the same time, though, crews discovered the underwater supports were in need of some work. That project went on until about 1950. In 1951, car traffic started using the bridge, and incidentally, that was the first time Perry Island residents were allowed to use the bridge since it was built the previous century. We used to have a ferry that went from Perry Sound to that other end of the reserve back and forth. There's a story that a disabled woman was in a car and the car rolled off the, the ferry and she drowned. So that tragedy actually spurned the government and uh, uh, the people at that time to allow us to cross the bridge then. In 1986, the railway company abandoned the line. One year later, Indian Affairs and Northern Development got control of the bridge. An inspection at that time showed that parts of the bridge were badly damaged, but for the most part, it was holding together. Engineers did the first major study of the bridge's condition in 1991. The report said the bridge should be replaced with a two-lane structure within three years. And if that didn't happen, they needed to have detailed plans of how they would extend its service life. That replacement never happened. The federal government paid um, CN Rail $300,000 in change. When it came into our looking after, they cut that in half. We were only given half the funds to look after the bridge. In 1995 and 96, more inspections showed that the bridge needed work right away in order to stay safe. That work happened in 1997, but the issues continued. By 2004, another report said that the bridge should be replaced no later than 2012. That replacement never happened. In 2015, Wasoxing First Nation, as it was now called, received another engineering report. It said the bridge needed major work right away and that it would need to have frequent inspections for the rest of its life. The engineer said, quote, the bridge will continue to deteriorate at an increasingly rapid rate, unquote. The engineer said that the community needed a new bridge as soon as possible because this old one was well past its service life. Since the 2000s, breakdowns on the swing bridge have been happening more often. By the end of the 2010s, there were multiple days each year when the bridge would go out of service. Engineers recommended slower speed limits for both water and road traffic, as well as weight restrictions. It started to swing less frequently, and it wouldn't turn at all if the winds were above 30 kilometers per hour. We keep being told, well, first of all, it's a swing bridge. It has some kind of historical value, but no one will come out and say, okay, it's historical, let's put some money into it and keep it going. We just have problems getting support for a new bridge or even upgrading this one to adequate standards. They keep throwing us a swing bridge on Manitoulin Island. Eh? They keep saying that one will, will receive help first before we do. In 2017, Indigenous Services Canada said it was designing a new bridge. That was around the same time as the Little Current Bridge project began. With the Little Current Bridge, we heard how many islanders are sentimental about their old swing bridge. It symbolized a new era of prosperity, and it helped them feel more physically connected to the rest of the country. Among the people I've spoken with in Wasoxing, it's a very different feeling. It is a symbol of the colonialist past, the fact that we had no say in the development of Depot Harbour. We had no say in, uh, in uh, making up the railway, and actually, now it does because we have band members who work in looking after the bridge, but up until that happened, we had no uh, the chance of working here. Uh, there was very little uh, financial, even social benefit to the community. So it's not really seen as a, as a positive. It does make sense. The people of Wasoxing had already been pushed to live on a reserve as colonizers took over all of their former lands. Then a colonization railway cut across that reserve against the community's wishes. This bridge cannot be separated from that history, and now that it's literally falling apart, it just makes the whole thing worse. There's been talk for decades that the government would finally replace this old bridge, but as I film this, it's 2022, and that work hasn't happened yet. For a community that has been let down by the government and corporations for generations, this old bridge 
is just another frustrating part of Canada's living history.